Hey, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Well, welcome everyone. Um, do uh, come and retake your seats. It's good, isn't it? It's good to see uh, so many people here. And uh, I'm, just, I'm just so pleased that you're, you're here. I'm so delighted that you've come along. And uh, what I'm going to do is for about half an hour, we're, I'm just going to preach from the book of James. Uh, as Malcolm said, we're finishing off our series in the book of James. And we're in James chapter 5. And I'd love you to have the passage in front of you. Um, so if you've got a Bible with you, then great, you can turn to it. If you don't, don't worry, because you can stick your hand up in the air and one of our welcome team will come and bring you a Bible to you in your seat. So just keep your hand up, it will arrive to you, um, and uh, it might be that your hand is up because you just don't own a Bible. And if that's the case, well, you can write your name in this one, you can keep it as a free gift from us, um, you can keep hold of it, it will do you good, it will bless you, um, and... Uh, and also, yeah, you can find the passage. I don't know what page number it's in, but James is towards the end of the Bible. So if you kind of go to the end and work backwards, you'll, you'll find it. Um, can I, before we get to it though, uh, whilst you're finding it, can I also extend my welcome along with Malcolm's to you? If you're here for the first time or you're just, you know, visiting this morning, then I'm really pleased that you've come. Um, it's lovely uh, seeing you. It's great to gather together um, at the start of the summer holidays. We've got a lot of our sort of regular church family who are away on holidays, which is good. So it's good to see so many guests here as well today. And a special welcome to Jim and Colette and also to Richard and Anne and Jill and also to Jane, Andrew and Francois who are, the, who are like kind of the grandparents to the kids who are being dedicated today. Uh, I'm so pleased that you've been able to come along. And, uh, and also Lydia, we've got a god mummy in the house too, which is always good. Welcome. Yeah, welcome Lydia. Um, so and we'll, we'll come to the dedications a little, a little later. It might be that you're in church for maybe the first time or maybe not since you were a kid and you might be thinking, oh, you know, wasn't sure what to expect. Maybe you watched the king's coronation and you saw all the hats and the robes and the, all the, the stuff and, you think, and that's what you were expecting. Maybe, I don't know, you were expecting something, so I don't know. But I just want you to know that, hey, we're a relaxed bunch. We love to worship God together. We love to uh, sing and we also love to preach from the Bible. The Bible contrary to popular belief, is actually a collection of 66 books. It's not just one book. It wasn't written by a few guys in a cave. Actually, it was written over a period of one and a half thousand years by at least 40 different authors. And yet, even though so, all so many books over such a long period of time, it has an amazing coherence and story, one narrative, uh, a remarkable consistency of God's message that he is coming to restore and redeem humanity, that he has sent his son to forgive the sins of everyone who goes against him, which is everyone, because all, all have sinned and fallen short. That Jesus paid the price for our sins, and by repenting and coming to him, we can find forgiveness and love, the embrace of the Heavenly Father. We can be reconciled to God, no longer strangers and foreigners, no longer apart from him, but actually we can pray to him, we can sing to him, and he hears our prayers, and he empowers us through his Holy Spirit. All of these things encourage us to live lives dedicated to God, and that's what this morning is about. It's about being people who live lives that are dedicated to God. One of the people that wrote one of the books in the Bible is James. And James is actually Jesus' younger brother. Um, Mary and Joseph were, were um, betrothed, engaged when they gave birth to Jesus. And then later on they got married and they consummated the married, marriage and kids came. And one of those kids was James. And James led a church in Jerusalem. And James' key message is that he looked at the religious leaders of the day and he hated their hypocrisy, much like Jesus. They would say one thing, but do another. And so his whole book is about making sure that 
we align our beliefs and our actions, our words and our deeds, that our values match up with the way we speak. If we praise Jesus on a Sunday, we should speak well and act like the same way on a, on a Tuesday, or on a Wednesday, or on a Thursday. It should align. And so um, when we come then to this dedication Sunday, we come to church and it's worth us considering then what is dedication all about? What does it mean to dedicate our children to God? But also actually what does it mean to dedicate our lives to him? Dedication, it means to be committed to a purpose, to committed to an act, like i.e. the woman is dedicated to her work. So what does it mean to live a life dedicated to God? Well, it means putting our faith into action. It means living our lives committed to uh, live as God intended us to. It means committing not just our lives, but our homes and our children to God's purposes. It means living living it out every day, that we might also impact the lives of those around us, our children, but also, yes, our colleagues and our friends and our neighbours. Child dedications, therefore, are not making a child a Christian. We can't do that. Only the child themselves can choose to follow Jesus um, when they're able to do that, often when they're older than maybe a few months old. But a dedication morning is giving thanks to God for these children. It is praying for them. It is getting alongside the parents and saying that we're going to support them in this God-given role of parenting. It's acknowledging that these children are first and foremost God's children that he's entrusted to these parents. It's um, committing our own lives, dedicating our own lives, the parents dedicating their own lives to God, choosing to follow him and praying that as their children see that life lived out, that they would come to follow him too. They would see a good example. It's a renewing a fresh willingness in us to live for Jesus, to follow him, to be obedient to him. And so, yes, this dedication morning is about the kids, but actually it's much more about the parents, about the parents living lives dedicated to God. In fact, in many ways, when all the different things that I'll be talking about today can apply to all of us. If you're a Christian here today, then you're also called to live your life dedicated to the Lord. If you're not a Christian here today, then hey, you get to see a little bit about what the Christians around you are meant to be doing and look like. And then over lunch, you can ask them, hey, so how are you doing with patience and forgiveness? And you can grill them. Um, It also gives you insight as to if you were to follow Jesus, what he's calling you to. I would say that a dedication Sunday, therefore, isn't so much about the day itself, but it's about the ongoing commitment to choose to live our lives dedicated to God. Much like a wedding day is an indication of a commitment that the couple are making for the rest of their lives, so the dedication morning is a commitment that the parents are giving to God to dedicate their lives to him and their children to him, to commit to um, following his purposes, to commit them to God's purposes and uh, and entrust God with their lives. Um, However challenging it might be, for better, for worse, for for richer or poorer, parents are persevering in their God-given role of parenting to trust God, to pray for their kids, to live lives committed to to him. Now, this is hard for all of us to do, especially it's hard for parents, isn't it? It's hard for parents. It's hard hard to do. And so as we finish the book of James, as a church, we've been going through the book of James. James finishes up his book with two kind of key points, and that is that we need patience and prayer. Patience in suffering, and we also need to know, uh, we need to come to him in prayer in all things. All Christians, in fact need to know patience in light of the challenges that we might face, but also prayer. So what we're going to do is going to read, I'm going to read through the passage in a minute, which you will have in the Bibles. It's also on the screen. Um, we'll read through from verse 7 right through to the end of James chapter 5. And, um, and it's a little bit 
tricky, some of the verses, but don't worry because we're then going to go through these verses and I'm just going to explain them. And I will mostly apply it to the parents here today that are dedicating their children, um, but I want to encourage you to apply it to your own life. It's all, all relevant. So here you go. Verse 7. I'll read it from the screen with you. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no, otherwise you'll be condemned. Is anyone among you in trouble? Well, let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they've sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain in the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. There you go. Welcome to Hope Church. Um, and uh, welcome to James chapter 5. This is James finishing off this book to this church in Jerusalem. Most of the people he's speaking to are Jewish, so they know lots of the references he referred to, like Elijah and Job. They know all this stuff. There's probably not many Jewish people here today, so you might not, 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 not know what was going on. But like I said, don't worry, we'll unpack it a bit. So as we live lives dedicated to God, what do we need? Patience. We need patience. Verse 1 says, Be patient then, brothers and sisters. How much patience do you need? Do you ever arrive at being someone who's fully patient? Well, James says you're going to need patience until the Lord returns. So basically, for the rest of your life, until Jesus returns, you will need patience. There will come a point where you don't need it anymore, where all things are made new, everything's restored, where there's no more sickness, death, dying, disease, or decay. That's when Jesus returned. But up until that point, you will need patience. Parents, you especially are going to need patience. I'm a parent, and uh, it's been great having Paul and Joe staying with us yesterday, and they witnessed firsthand the kind of patience that I needed of my kids yesterday um, as they were just full of beans it was chucking it down the rain so they're cooped in the house all day and it was a bit chaotic but hey pay we need patience we need patience and um, they're good things to to have parents need patience even in fact here's a question if you're a parent of someone whose children are now over 20 do you still need patience Yes. yes that's a yes you still need patience. doesn't matter how old your kids are, you need patience. It's like James said, until the Lord returns, you need patience. Sometimes uh, I hear parents say, oh, Lord, give me strength when they're struggling with their kids. Really, you should be saying, oh, Lord, please let Jesus return. Because that's the point where you don't need patience anymore. And to illustrate this patience that's needed, James comes up with this farming analogy. Uh, It's one that all of his listeners and readers would have been aware of. And basically he says that everything has its season. Everything has its season. The farmer patiently waits, waits for the spring rains. And there's a period where there's droughts, where the sun is beaming down, where he looks at the crops and he knows that the crops need the rain. To, to flourish, to bear fruit, to bring the harvest. But the farmer waits. He waits patiently. 
He knows that the next season is coming. He knows that the spring rains are coming. But in the, in the midst of the challenges, in the midst of the scorching heat, all he can do is be patient. All he can do is wait. In the midst of having children, things can seem like an eternity. When you're in a moment where there's just a challenging season of life, we can have all sorts of anxieties as parents. Oh, are they going to... When are they going to learn to eat proper foods? Or when are they going to learn to walk? Or when are they going to learn to dress themselves? Or I can't wait till they get to that stage when they no longer need me to brush their teeth. Or they know, you know, and we, we are impatient for the next stage because we can't wait for X, Y, or Z to happen. But just as the farmer waits patiently, parents, hey, we're called to wait patiently. Christians, we're called to wait patiently in the midst of challenges. Why do we need patience? Well, it's because we constantly compare ourselves to others. I used to do it all the time. Talia, she um, didn't learn to walk till quite late compared to other people. And so she would do this kind of bum shuffling thing. She never crawled either, so she didn't, she didn't crawl. I think she liked to hold things in her hands and she'd just kind of shuffle on her bum so she could hold the things in her hands and she'd go from one bit to the other. And all these other parents would have their kids crawling around. Oh, wonderful, making, you know, making progress. Or walking around, brilliant, making progress, but not Talia, just... But I'm shuffling, but I'm shuffling along. Talia's my oldest daughter, by the way, not just some random kid that I'm talking about. Um, and I remember a wise person saying to me, um, don't worry, you don't see many 18-year-olds bum shuffling, well, maybe after the club at night, but <laughs> other than that, they all learn to walk. The seasons come. Be, be patient. It will come in its timing. And one day... They will walk, and then you're going to want them to sit and just be still. And there was one day that she did. I think she must have just looked around and observed everyone else, what they were doing. And then she must have just decided, oh, I think I know how to do that now. And she got up and walked and then never stopped. And she still continues to do that today. In the midst of challenges, our seasons can feel like an eternity. But like every grandparent says... Cherish the moment now, because in the blink of an eye, they'll all be grown and gone. Every new stage of life brings with itself, obviously, new opportunities, but also new challenges. And so, like the farmer, we just need to be patient. We need to recognise the season we're in and just wait for God's timing. Don't look to what season everyone else is in, but instead, be patient. And I guess, why do we need this? Because when we're not patient, what do we do? We start to grumble. And so he goes on to say, hey, don't grumble against each other. It's so easy to fight and to quarrel with one another. If you're a Christian, there will be times in church when your patience runs thin. And frankly, you want to strangle someone. And uh, Maybe it's for parents, for their kids. And James says, no, no, don't. Come on, don't grumble with one another. And we need to hear this, don't we, as parents? Because it's easy to kind of get to the end of our tether. But actually, he's encouraging us, no, come on, we need to support one another. We need to be in it together for a richer, for poorer, for better, for health. We need to work together, moving in the same direction, encouraging one another, being patient with one another, checking in together, especially, he says, in the face of suffering. And then he gives two examples. And he says, consider the prophets and consider Job. These are people who went through particularly challenging times and trials and, and yet showed incredible patience and perseverance in it. And um, the trials sometimes we can think are unique to us. In our kind of individual culture, we can think that we're the only ones going through this. No one really understands. When other people try to give us advice, they don't really know. But actually trials have happened for all eternity. And we all will go through them. And as we do, there's these examples to think about. He starts off with the prophets, and we don't know which prophets particularly he was talking about, but I wonder maybe if he was speaking of Jeremiah, for example. Jeremiah was a person who was um, betrayed by his family. He was beaten. He was put in stocks. He was imprisoned by the king. He was threatened with death, and he was thrown into a cistern, which is like a bog pit. Not pleasant. And yet, throughout it all, Jeremiah remained faithful, and as the passage says, he continued to speak in the name of the Lord. He continued to live a life dedicated to God, trusting him, following him, 
In the midst of trials, he persevered and stood firm in his faith to God. Parents, in the midst of the challenges, in the midst of the trials, as your children grow, you're called to stand firm, trusting God, dedicating your life to him. It means persevering through the trials. It means trusting that God will be the just judge who will deliver his timing and deliver righteousness in his own timing. For now, you can live in the good of his compassion and his mercy, uh, as we heard a bit earlier from, from Malcolm and through the different songs. Job is a second example. And uh, Job, similarly, like Jeremiah, he lost everything. And yet, he, everything was res- given back to him. Everything that he lost was restored to him. And it's a great example of someone who showed incre- incredible perseverance in the midst of great suffering and how it all ended up in a glorious way. And so James is kind of encouraging Christians. He's saying, hey, there is a time that will come when Jesus returns where all will be lost. The suffering that you've endured will feel like a momentary trouble. The hardship that you faced will feel like insignificant in the light of eternity, a glorious eternity in God. And so he shows us to Job. He says, hey, remember Job? Suffered a long time. There's like 40 chapters of all the suffering that he went through and then a few chapters showing all the amazing blessings that he was given. And it's a good reminder to Christians, hey, that God is merciful and he is compassionate. And that as he comes, he can... And as you walk this life, dedicate to him. Even in the midst of the trials, you can know his presence with you in the trials. In the valley, he's there. On the mountains, he's there. It might be you're a Christian here today and you're going through a trial. You're going through some challenges. How you can know the Lord's presence with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. He promises to be near to you, to, to draw near to you as you draw near to him. And so we're called to stand firm. And then this last point in the whole patient section is that he's, he comes, James comes and he says, there'll be times where you're going to be tempted to swear. Trust me. Parents, there'll be times where you want to swear. And yet James is like, no, don't swear. Don't swear. Don't swear by heaven. Don't swear by earth. Just keep it simple. Say yes and no. I always have these challenges. My kids are girls and I don't want to stereotype but they seem to remember everything. And so if I say something like one day, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll we'll do that on Saturday. Saturday will come. Daddy, you promised us an ice cream on Saturday. Or Daddy, you've said we could go to the park. And often it comes at the most inconvenient time. It's like 10 minutes before bed. Daddy, you said we can have an ice cream. So I've learned recently, this is quite a recent learning for me, and so last week in the car, on the way to school, or on the way back, they are, they've been asking for stuff, and I've just been saying a, saying a flat, no, no, we're not doing it. Oh, come on, please, no, no, we're not doing it. And they tried it on with me, later on they said, oh, but daddy, you promised, and I was like, did I? Or did I just say no? And they're like, yeah, you did say no. I've even stopped saying maybe, because if you say, oh, maybe if we have time, they count that as a promise. You said... No, keep it simple. Say no. And that's exactly what James says. Keep it simple. Don't swear. Don't say, yeah, I'll, I swear on my mom. I swear on my dad. I swear on God in heaven that I did that or I didn't do that or I will do this. Yes and no. Nice and simple. Parents, it will stand you in good stead. It's taken me 10 years to learn it. You're welcome. So, but what happens when we do get in trouble? What happens, parents, when we do get stuck? What happens when life isn't going as planned? When it all feels like the world is falling apart around us, what do we do? Well, as he finishes his book, as well as patience and perseverance, James says, hey, we need to pray. Whatever circumstance you're in, if anyone among you is in trouble, let them pray. If they're happy, let them praise. Whatever it's good stuff or bad stuff, where life's going well or challenging, we're called to pray. We're called to come to God. We're called to bring ourselves near to him. This is what Catherine, my wife, is really good at. In all circumstances, she's very good at gathering the kids together. Hey, let's pray pray about this. Let's bring this to God. When times are tough, we don't need to be the ones to model all the knowledge to our kids. 
We don't need to be the ones that have all the answers. Frankly, we don't really, do we? We're kind of making it up as we go along. But we do need to be the ones who model prayer. And that will stand in a good stead. So that when they get older, and they don't have all the answers, they don't have all the knowledge, hey, they know, but this is what I can depend on. This is what I can do. I can be patient, and I can pray. I can come to God in prayer. This example is a great value to us. We're called to faithful prayer. It's good things for our kids to learn. So whether we're in trouble, whether we're happy, we're, com- we're called to bring it to God in prayer. And the point James is making is that we should bring our family in on that journey. And then he, he encourages us even further and he says, hey, you're not alone in this. He goes on to say, pray with the elders. Pray with one another. Tell each other what's going on. Confess your sins. Hey, if you've messed up, tell, tell someone, hey, I did this. Can you, can you help me? It says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Being part of a church family, being part of a community of believers, supporting one another, holding up one another in prayer, speaking the truth in love, encouraging one another is so important, especially when we're going through trials and challenges, when we're weak, when we're struggling. Hey, parents, you can look around. You've got church family here. You've got your own family here who want to support you in the challenges. There's a... um, He then gives an example of Elijah. And he says, hey, you should pray like Elijah, because Elijah was a man, he says, is just like us. Now, when I first read that, I was thinking, is he really just like us? Elijah was this person who uh, prayed to God that it wouldn't rain for three and a half years, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. And then he prayed that it would rain, and it did rain. He was a guy who came up against other people who were worshippers of Baal, And they had a bit of a competition on top of a hill when they set up two altars with wood. And he said, hey, why don't you pray to Baal and pray that he would light the the altar, light the fire. And I'll pray to my God and we'll see whose God is real. And so these guys, they danced around singing and praising, uh, asking for the God of Baal to light this fire. And nothing happened. And uh, he mocked them a bit and said, oh, why don't you just pray a bit louder? Maybe he's sleeping. Wake him up. And uh, they tried and nothing happened. And in, in an incredible show of God's power and Elijah's faith, Elijah then got water and tipped it all over his wood. And then he stood back and prayed. And the God of the Bible lit it alight. It's an amazing miracle. You can read it in 1 Kings chapter 18. And, um, and I think... I'm not sure I'd be confident in doing that. I'm not sure that Elijah is just like me and you. But I wonder if actually, um, far from James encouraging us to imitate Elijah's miracles, he's encouraging us to imitate his prayer life. He's saying, hey, you can pray just like Elijah prayed. James, one of the person that, you know, Jesus' brother, one of the people who wrote the books of the Bible was probably similarly like me, thinking, oh, I'm not sure I can do that. I can't do the miracles, but I can do the prayer. And that's what he's encouraging all, each of us to do, is to pray. And as we pray, believe actually that God, who is in heaven, is able to do amazing things, far beyond what we can dream or imagine. Prayer is powerful and effective. And so in all circumstances, we're called to pray. Pray when you're happy, pray when you're sad, pray all the time, pray for one another, pray for your children. Trust that when you pray in faith that your prayers are powerful and effective. Believe and know that the Lord listens to your prayers. He doesn't always answer it in the way that we want him to answer. But he is at work. He is moving, even when you don't see it. And so we're all called to come and pray, to lift it up to God and then entrust our situations and our circumstances in his his hands knowing that he's able to work all things to good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. We pray because it reminds us of who we are in light of who God is and what he has done. And so it's important for us to remember that we're all humans. It's important for us to remember that we get things wrong. Parents, it's important for you to remember that you're not perfect, neither are you called to be perfect. It's important for us to remember that Christians, each of us, will mess up in some ways or go astray in others. And we don't stand in judgment upon one another, but instead we're ready to draw people back in with 
hospitality and kindness. And so James's last point is to be ready to forgive when others have messed up. He says, my, bro- my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. James is not naive enough to say that people won't ever mess up, that once they become a Christian, they'll be perfect. No, he doesn't, doesn't say that. Parents, you shouldn't be naive enough to think that your kids are going to grow up to be perfect and never wander astray or never do things that you perhaps aren't your values. No, no, they will. But as parents, we're called to be people who are ready with open arms to welcome our kids back in, to welcome those who have gone astray back in. A bit like the prodigal son who you're going to hear more about next week as Maddie comes and preaches on why she followed Jesus and looks at that story. He's there searching and waiting, ready to welcome back in this son that has gone astray like a wonderful father that he is. Parents, we're called to do the same. In fact, Christians, church, Hope Church, we're called to do the same. So there you go. What do we need, parents? Patience and prayer. Patience and prayer. All these things will stand us in good stead. All these things are things that we want to support and encourage the parents that are dedicating their children in today. And maybe the band can just come back up. And as they do, it's a good thing to remind us that why can we do these things? And who should we follow who have ultimately done all these things? Well, it's Jesus. Jesus, who is the one who has fully lived a life dedicated to God. Jesus, the one who was patient with those even who were persecuting him. Jesus is the one who prayed to the Father and said, even in, at the point of death, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Jesus is the one who is willing, even when we walk away from him, when we do things against him, to welcome us back with loving arms. Jesus is the one who promises never to leave us or forsake us. Jesus, the one who has separated our sins from us as far as the east is from west. Jesus, the one who's always praying for us on behalf of the Father. He's interceding for us on behalf of him. The one who's always slow to anger, abounding in love. The one who separates our sin from us as far as the east is from west. The one that you can never run too far away from. In the depths, God is there. In the heights, God is there. In the valleys, God is there. There is nowhere you can go where you are too far from God's love and his grace. Jesus lived his life dedicated to God and to his purposes. And he calls every Christian, every little Christ, to do the same, to live a life dedicated to God, to his purposes, being patient in the face of suffering, continually bringing all the different challenges we have in prayer. God the Father, the one who's a wonderful example of the perfect parent, he encouraged us to follow suit. He so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believed in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God didn't send his son in the world to condemn the world, but to save it. It's an amazing example we have in Jesus, amazing one that we have to follow as we all aim to live lives dedicated to him. Let's stand, shall we? I just want to encourage us. We're going to sing, really, a prayer over one another. Is that right? Yeah. And uh, this is words. These, the words that we're going to sing are words taken from Numbers chapter 6. In fact, I'm going to be praying these words over uh, the children that we dedicate later on. And, uh, but I want to encourage us as a church family, as a sign of unity with one another, that we should bless one another. That we should ask Lord to bless one another. And so it's not so much a, a song of worship to God, but a song of praise over one another. In fact, the Bible would encourage us to do that, to greet one another with a kiss to sing praises over one another and what we're going to do today is we're just going to take a moment to sing whilst we do this parents can you go and get your kids and and bring them back in and then we'll do the the dedications let's sing